Jackie Ottman is the founder and principal of the New York City-based J. Ottman Consulting Incorporated that are advisors on green marketing and eco-innovation to Fortune 500 companies and several United States government eco-labeling programs. Her clients include 3M, Nike, Johnson & Johnson, and many others. Um, she has helped to guide the marketing of several consumer product labels, including the US EPA's Energy Star, Green Seal, and the new USDA Certified Biobased label. Prior to founding her firm in 1989, Jackie was the new Product and Consumer Insights Specialist at major advertising agencies with clients including Procter & Gamble and Rouse & Purina. She's a native New Yorker and was educated at Smith College with an advanced certification for facilitating the Osborne Parnes creative problem solving process from the Creative Education Foundation. She is also certified by the U.S. Zero Waste Business Council in Orange County, California as a Zero Waste Business Associate. So Jackie, without further ado, I introduce you now um, to go ahead and tell us how we can waste less and live better. Jackie, you may begin. Hello, everybody. It's great to be back presenting in this series. I have just one goal for all of us today, and that is simply I want to give you five fresh new ways to look at the three R's of reduce, reuse, and recycle. I want you to live better and have strengthened communities. Now, we've all been hearing so much for so long about the three R's, you might be a little skeptical that there's really anything new to learn. But my hope today is that by the end of the webinar, you'll be looking at them in a whole new light. Now that's actually the challenge we set for ourselves that we hate to waste. We want to bring that centuries old waste not, want not mentality into the 21st century to update it for a new generation. As Gretchen mentioned, or, or has it mentioned, but I'll, I'll bring you up to date on this, Ingersoll Rand has been a sponsor of We Hate to Waste for the past year. We're very proud and grateful for your company's support. Your sponsorship has enabled us to take this initiative to a next level. And specifically, it's allowed us to jumpstart creative thinking about important questions like, what does a resource-efficient lifestyle that people would want to live look like? And what are the best ways that concerned consumers, like everyone on this call, can use to make meaningful change in their communities? We're very pleased that many of you have opted to join We Hate to Waste in the past year, and we hope many of you will join us by subscribing at the site after this webinar. It's free and easy to do. So now let's take a look at the agenda, followed by a brief introductory overview of what we waste here in the U.S. I'll spend the bulk of our time together today reviewing the five strategies that everyone can use to reduce waste and live better. They're reevaluate your consumption, share rather than own your possessions, use products responsibly, close the loop, and influence others. I'll wrap up with some end thoughts and suggest a couple of next steps. So according to the US EPA, we here in the US generate 250 million tons of municipal solid waste each year. Municipal solid waste consists of what we discard from our homes, offices, restaurants, and hospitals. Now that's the equivalent of over four pounds per person each and every day. This has been on a steady incline since 1960 with the introduction of convenience items like disposable diapers, fast food, and other products that have been de demanded by working women in two-income households. The numbers you see here, however, represent only a fraction of total waste, which is nearly 70 times more than this when you factor in industrial and agricultural waste, mining waste, and so forth. Now, it seems like we're all pretty busy recycling these days, but in actuality, only 34% of all municipal solid waste is recovered for recycling or composting. 11% is incinerated with some of that going to energy. But over half of our solid waste, the whopping 54% as of 2012, winds up in a landfill. Now this, of course, is tremendous concern given all the associated impacts of landfilled waste to our environment and our health, 
as well as the impacts to our economy of having these resources literally go to waste. So a global movement is now underway towards zero waste, or diverting resources from landfills by recycling, composting, and more importantly, to prevent waste from occurring in the first place. The good news is that we can both divert and prevent waste while living better. So let me show you those five ways to do just that. First is to evaluate what you buy and why. Waste isn't something that occurs just at the end of a consumption process. Waste really be begins at the moment of desire. So the next time you're about to buy something, ask yourself why you're buying it. And if you really need to be buying it in the first place, and I mean that in two ways, as I'll explain further. Buying things is like getting married to an object. Think not just about what it took to make that item in the first place, but about the investment in your time, money, space, as well as all the natural resources that will come with owning that item over its useful life and disposing it at the end. Let's take a moment to consider the reasons why we buy things. We live in an industrialized society. We no longer make our own clothes, build our own houses, grow or even cook a lot of our meals. Most of this is done for us by industry. Humans need to consume. And we consume for more reasons than meeting basic needs for food, clothing, and shelter. We consume a lot of the things we do for reasons such as identification, status, or even entertainment. It's back to school week. What's the first thing a college freshman does when he or she gets to campus? Why, they head to the bookstore to start buying the stuff, the sweatpants, the shirts, and all the rest. Now, I'm not saying that these things are necessarily wasteful in and of themselves, because some of these needs are important to us as humans, but the process of manufacturing, using, and disposing of products creates a lot of waste. And sadly, many of the things we buy these days are used for only a short period of time before they get tossed into those landfills forever. One example is disposable coffee cups, which are not recyclable. Did you know that if you used one disposable coffee cup each day for a year, you'd be throwing away the equivalent of over 87 pounds of greenhouse gases, 76 gallons of water, 126 trees, and 12 pounds of solid waste. So we really waste a lot more when we waste than it eats the eye. Consider these impacts in light of the fact that we Americans use 108 billion disposable coffee cups each year. So that's what's behind the impetus to come up with alternatives. That brings me to another point. When you go to buy things, try to buy things of high quality. Chances are if you really need something, you'll likely want it to last a long time and provide you with a high degree of functionality and satisfaction. This is the essence of what it means to reduce. And it's why reduce sits atop the EPA solid waste hierarchy, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So, is there a good alternative to disposable coffee cups? We think so. This post was recently published at We Hate to Waste. It describes a superior coffee experience that's now possible because of innovative design and high-tech materials. Thanks to an ingenious retractable handle, it can be attached to a backpack or purse so you never have to worry about losing it or your investment in the resources it embodies. As I mentioned, we're on a mission at We Hate to Waste to jumpstart creativity. Our community is very excited about the potential to build upon good ideas to help communities get to zero waste. One good question that's prompted by the success of this reusable coffee cup is, in what ways might we try to mainstream the use of reusable coffee cups, water bottles, by making them easier to use, even cool? So we were very excited when we came across a not-for-profit initiative called KillTheCup.com. A recent graduate of the University of San Diego Business School is now challenging college students on 
competing campuses to post selfies with their reusable coffee mugs in exchange for cash awards for their campus sustainability programs. Are you all thinking what I'm thinking? This is a very simple idea that can be executed by green teams and businesses like yours in digital form like the Kill the Cup initiative or even simply on a lunchroom bulletin board. Let's move on to a second related strategy. Let's say you decide you really need something and you want it to be of high quality. Ask yourself if you can simply share it with others instead of buying it. So this is a new take on reuse. Notice that I put the word sharing in quotes because I don't mean sharing in the traditional sense of the word, but rather using various means that are now available to gain access to an item on just those occasions when you need it and no more. From a waste standpoint, sharing puts embodied resources to intensive use. And because you're sharing with others, you can oftentimes get access to better quality goods than you might otherwise be able to afford on your own. Let's take a look at some of the many ways to share these days thanks to new technologies. First, it's now possible to get good quality things perfectly for free on sites like FreeCycle and Trash Nothing, apps and online exchanges like Neighbor Goods, Peerbee, and Ripe Near Me allow one to borrow or swap with neighbors. Alternatively, you can rent or lease items for a short or extended length of time, and I'll talk about a great site for doing that in a moment. And of course, you can also buy previously owned items from thrift or consignment shops, which are incorporating modern merchandising methods these days to enhance the shopping experience, as well as on eBay and Craigslist. Now what's great about sharing strategies outside of saving resources and money is they help you save the time, space required to maintain, store, and eventually dispose of these things. One of my favorite concepts was also written up in another post, We Hate to Waste. It's called Rent the Runway. Rent the Runway is an online website that allows women to rent formal wear, paying just a fraction of what one might ordinarily pay for dresses outright. It's about time, right everybody? Rent the One Way allowed a young woman named Adrian to rent a designer dress to wear to a friend's wedding for just $80. That same gown will not now be sitting in the back for closet forever, and it will likely be worn by many more women in the future. Business concepts like Rent the One Way are prompting us to ask new questions to mine the potential to use sharing as an alternative to buying. One good question to ask, how might we better utilize the resources that already exist in our communities to help people reduce waste and live better? Relatedly, we can ask, in what ways might we make borrowing the new buying? I know a lot of mothers who would love to see their kids doing a lot more borrowing to cut down on the competition in the schoolyard for the latest stuff. And finally, a more specific question might be, what else might libraries loan besides books? Communities are answering this question with lending libraries for tools like this one in Vancouver. Tool lending libraries now exist in as many as 60 different cities, including New York, Oakland, and New Orleans and even as far away as Edinburgh, Scotland. You can get a really good community feel from this just by looking at the picture. Speaking of books, little free libraries are cropping up around the world. Why not in office cubbies and break rooms? And something I find to be very exciting, community refrigerators like this one are cropping up all over Europe and even Saudi Arabia as a way of feeding the hungry. I can't speak to legal issues here, but I've not heard about any health issues related to passing along food in this way. A third strategy that all consumers can do to reduce waste is to use the products responsibly. A great deal of waste is created during the useful life of a product, like the paper that runs through a copier, for instance. 
an important part of responsible usage and product ownership, which is showing some signs of actually getting easier these days, is repairing products when necessary. By way of interest, the Japanese have a fascinating ancient tradition called kintsugi. Have you heard about it? They repair ceramic items like this bowl in precious gold to actually draw attention to the break. Kintsugi springs from a Japanese cultural tradition called matayanai. That is the topic of this post that we hate to waste. Aligning with motayanai means revering the spirit that exists in every object such that you keep things in good repair. And when they're no longer useful, you repurpose the materials into something else, as this woman is doing with worn kimonos. I personally find this really inspiring. And that little kintsugi bowl reminds me of patches on men's jackets that have become a fashion item unto themselves. Now, many upscale products come with a manufacturer's warranty and even a repair service. Did you know that Harley-Davidson maintains parts for its motorbikes going back to 1917? But many manufacturers don't support their products, and of course, many products are difficult or impossible to repair. How frustrating does that make you feel? Many products manufacturers simply don't have an incentive to make their products repairable because replacing them is so cheap. This is a prime cause of waste. So what can you do as a consumer to encourage manufacturers and retailers to repair and refurbish products? And there's also something new you can do to take the situation into your own hands. It's called the fixer revolution. Have you heard about it? Repair cafes and fixer collectives like this one you see here now exist in more than 700 cities on five continents. People come together for the sheer love of fixing things and being in community. Many fixers don't charge for this service. Here's a question. How many of you take special pride in fixing something, especially when you've been told it can't be done? If you're like me, it can make your day. What other opportunities exist in your community to leverage native skills to reduce waste? All you have to do is pose this creative challenge and ideas will come to you. One of my favorites, women love to get together to sew and knit. I'd like to see mending circles crop up in communities with the purpose of sewing buttons and hems for people who don't know how to and to teach them to do the same. It's all part of reskilling for sustainability. It's tempting for me to think about what a company like Ingersoll Rand with so many engineers on board can come up with to help members of your own communities. The fourth strategy is to close the loop via recycling and composting. Now we're all very familiar with recycling, but it's fraught with misconceptions there's still a lot more we can all learn in order to maximize recycling's effectiveness and increase participation. The best place to start is to learn the real meaning of the recycling logo. Do you know what each of the three arrows actually stands for? Hint, it's not reduce, reuse, and recycle, which so many people think it means. It means something very different. Quite intuitive, but very little known. Let me pull back the curtain on the recycling logo. The top arrow relates to the need to start by collecting materials in local communities. The second arrow represents the need for businesses to make saleable products out of the materials that have been collected. And the third arrow means that consumers need to buy the products made from the recycled materials to, in effect, Close the loop. This makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But what intrigues me as a marketing person is how many times a day we now have to reinforce this message and how much traction we could get for recycling if people understood their own role in this process. So it's important for all of us to get more involved in recycling, but also to encourage businesses to design products so they can be disassembled for recycling and then to make the products with recycled content. And in fact, extended producer responsibility laws 
are starting to do just that, but much more can be done. By the way, products that are designed for recycling are often easier to repair. A third and final way to close the loop is to learn more about what can be recycled in your community. 11% of what winds up in a landfill after all the recyclables are diverted are clothing and textiles. That's a big number. Here in New York, we're getting pickups in our apartment buildings for clothing and textiles, which is very exciting considering that many people now throw away worn clothing or something slightly stained, thinking it cannot be used by others, but they are in fact recyclable or reusable for another purpose. Another big item that winds up in landfills because it is not otherwise diverted or composted is food waste. Over 20% of everything in a landfill is food waste. Now I know food waste is an issue that's a personal concern to many of you today. Now there's a lot of issues with food going to waste. An important one is that food that winds up in a landfill degrades into methane, a greenhouse gas that's over 20 times more potent than CO2. So we really need to compost as much as possible and of course reduce the amount of food we throw away in the first place. A good place to begin to reduce food waste is to better understand what is commonly thought of as expiration dates on food that's purchased in grocery stores. Most of the dates you see are really not expiration dates at all. They're there simply to indicate when a product is at its peak in terms of flavor or freshness. Oftentimes a simple smell test will tell if something is no longer safe to eat. It's great to see the publicity this issue is getting now. This post at We Hate to Waste was written by Dana Gunders, one of the co-authors of a definitive Harvard study on this topic. I encourage you to read it for a lot of important details. Now donating food to the hungry is another way to divert food waste from landfills. I'm very intrigued by a new opportunity that was recently submitted to WeHateToWaste.com. A not-for-profit group in New Jersey called MoveForHunger.org picks up unused edible food from pantries on moving day and redistributes it to the hungry. They coordinate with local real estate firms in the process. This is a great idea that can be replicated just about anywhere. After making sure that food is actually eaten by people or animals, another important thing to do is to compost in your community and even in your own backyards. And there's no excuse if you live in a city. Five green moms got together and started this composting program in their children's New York City school. Their efforts has inspired a program that is now rolling out across the entire city. It has been written up in this other post that's up at We Hate to Waste. And speaking of compost in the city, Marja Oberg from Thermo King Europe submitted a great post to us showing us how she composts on her terrace in Madrid. She did a great job in the post of dispelling a lot of the misconceptions of composting. I encourage you all to read it and get inspired to give composting a try. And guess what? You might get some pretty good tasting vegetables and good looking flowers in the process. Now the fifth and final strategy that every consumer can use to reduce waste and live better is to influence others. Most of you mentioned in the poll last year that this is something you wanted to learn more about. There's many things you can do. Just a few of them include being a role model in your community. Inspire people through your own actions. Relay Lertzman had great ideas in this series for doing that. Don't be afraid to share your ideas or solutions with others. No one has a lock on creativity in this regard. And as I tried to demonstrate, people are coming up with great new ideas all the time. That's what gets us up in the morning. Teach children, friends, family, coworkers. There's many triggers that will motivate people to act. One of them is simply enlightening them about the facts, helping them care about these issues by helping them understand why it's so important. Keep learning, 
Try out new habits, practices, products, and share your thoughts and experience with others. Notice recently there's a whole network of zero-waste bloggers out there and getting longer. And ask questions. Hopefully this presentation has prompted a few good ones that you can ask me today. This is a post from We Hate to Waste with lots of fresh ideas for making it easy and fun to be less wasteful at home. One of the interesting things I've discovered since founding We Hate to Waste is the many inventive ways that parents and spouses use to try to convert children or other people to be less wasteful. So in summary, waste is a function of our modern society. We don't have to generate as much waste as we do. Individual consumers can work to change the system, starting from the grassroots with what we ourselves can do in our personal and our work lives and how we can influence others in our families, friends, and community members. We can even influence businesses and government to reduce waste so we all can live better and ensure that future generations can too. Great ideas for reducing waste and living better and enhancing our communities can come from anywhere all around the globe. It's one of the interesting things and totally fascinating things I found since founding We Hate to Waste. To sum up, particular opportunities exist to reevaluate what we buy. And if we buy with the intent to own something outright, to try to buy quality things designed to last. Good strategy for maximizing reuse of things that already exist is to share with others. And in doing so, take advantage of exciting new digital outlets that can help us borrow, swap, and donate to neighbors, or just rent quality items for a short amount of time. Third is to use products more responsibly. Cut down on the throughput of consumables and help to conserve resources by ensuring that products stay in good repair. Close the loop by buying products made of recycled content and keeping uneaten food out of landfills via food donation and composting. And look for the myriad ways to influence others by inspiring them with the ways you're learning about and doing every day in your own lives to live better. It sounds really simple, but it does make a difference. So as one of two immediate next steps, take a private pledge right at your desk to put into practice just one of the five things I've discussed to reduce waste in your home, your work, and while you're on the go. And lastly, I invite you to join us at We Hate to Waste by subscribing at the site yourself. You learn much more about what I just presented, and you'll connect with like-minded folks who share your passion and want to share their ideas with you. So that concludes my presentation, and, and please feel free to share any new ideas you might have gotten as a result, anything new you've discovered on your own. Thank you.